Welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. Let's talk about The Batman. Was it good? Was it great? A little later, I'm gonna be joined by two of the best, Matt Singer and Patrick H. Willem. Say hi guys. Hello. Hello. But for now, here's my take. Before this movie, I was kind of over Batman movies. It seemed like Warner Brothers only had faith in one of their movie characters, so they just kept going back to the Batwell over and over. I even liked Ben Affleck's Batman, but he was the Justice League character that I was least interested in seeing more of. DC has a rich stable of characters that have never been on the big screen. Where's my Hawkman movie? My Adam movie? Heck, where's my good Superman movie? I wanted Warner Brothers to emulate Marvel Studios and create something with lesser tier characters that we don't know everything about. For me, Batman seemed very played out because every movie version has to have its origin, its cave, its Joker. And don't get me wrong, I love Batman. I've got hundreds of Batman comics, seen the animated series countless times, here's me as a kid with some of my Batman stuff and also really embarrassing glasses. So I want you to understand my attitude going into this movie was very clinical. I am here to watch Batman to make videos. But during the movie, Matt Reeves totally flipped my attitude around. I loved this Batman movie and now, I think that there are not enough Batman movies. I think what really set this film apart was the setting. This Gotham City is an entirely new creation, and it's the first Gotham City that, to me, felt real. Most of it was filmed on location in cities like Glasgow, Liverpool, Chicago, New York. So this Gotham ends up feeling like an amalgam of the worst elements of all those cities. It was grimy, nasty, imperfect, lived in, and it reflects what's happening inside Bruce's soul. This Gotham's renewal fund was stunted by the death of Tom Thomas Wayne, which also stunted the emotional growth of Bruce. This is a city that time has left behind. Christopher Nolan famously distanced his films from the 90s Batman movies by trying to make them feel realistic. He filmed on location in Chicago, and those movies have a much more grounded feel, especially when you compare it to this. Destroy everything! But Nolan is always so precise with everything. The camera movements are always clean. All the visuals hum like clockwork. In this movie, nothing about Gotham is clean or precise. Matt Reeves lets figures be obscured by shadows, by rain, by lights. We can't ever really tell what's going on, which adds to the noir detective story that he's telling. The only part of this movie that does feel like clockwork is the screenplay itself. I loved how every element of the story slotted perfectly into place, just like the Riddler's plan. And we're making videos about every clue and the symbol of his riddles and how it all reflects what's happening inside of Bruce at all times. Because none of this matters if it doesn't service the emotional story of the main character, Bruce Wayne. As Gotham's corruption becomes public, the Gothamites have to struggle with the idea that their city was built on a lie. And when Bruce learns about his father's mob ties, he also has to struggle with the truth about his family. This Batman is broken. He's sad. He's trying to expel all the humanity from himself and just be Batman. He doesn't emote much, but he doesn't have to. See, all of Robert Pattinson's bat forebearers have done some heavy lifting for him. We know the origin, we know the pain, we know he's trained and built gadgets, so his performance can just focus on the story that's being told here and now. We don't need to see his family die in the alley because we can see it on the pain written across his face. But also, this movie was just so freaking cool. The car chase was stellar, the fire jump, badass. The hallway fight, always love a hallway fight. This is the Batman that we all want protecting our city. It was just so freaking good. I wanna keep watching it in theaters, buy the Lego Batman toys, I want all the things. But these days doing all that's gonna be a little bit too pricey. Luckily, I have Top Cash Back, the sponsor of this video. Top Cash Back, what's that? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Top Cash Back is an online shopping portal that makes a commission every time you make a purchase through them. But here's the best part. They pass 100% of that commission back to you. I bet you have to pay a membership fee or something like that, right? Nope, it is 100% free to use. So here's how it works. The website lists retailers that they partner with. Peacemaker made me want to see more hair metal, so I looked up Motley Crue tickets on StubHub. So with my purchase, I would earn a 6% commission through Top Cash Back that I would get back in just a few days. Also, their browser extension makes this even easier. Whenever you do a Google search, you automatically see their logo on the brands that they partner with. For instance, I bought my Batman tickets through Fandango and earned a 3% commission. And I bought some sweet Batman Legos through Top Cash Back and made the commission on those too. Now the categories for what earns you cash back change frequently, but 
you can always see what's being offered on their merchant page. Right now, they're offering a $10 sign-up bonus when you spend $25 or more, which I then use toward my Batman movie ticket. Plus, on top of that, you still get the normal cashback percentage on all your purchases. Now, these are all products that I was already going to buy, and with Top Cash Back, I get a little bit of my money back. They have more than 4,400 retailers to choose from, and members earn an average of $345 every year. So, click the link in the description and get started today. Back to Batman. But I am lucky to be here with two people who know way more about film and about Batman than I ever could. We are joined by Screen Crush Editor-in-Chief Matt Singer and brilliant YouTube video essayist Patrick H. Willems. How are you guys doing today? Ready for a polite, calm discussion about Batman. Okay, Matt, first I want to hear from you. Of course, your review is up on ScreenCrush.com. Terrific review. But I want to hear your thoughts. What, what did you think about The Batman? I thought it was the pretty good. Um, I I liked it. You know, overall, had a had a had good bleak, dark, gritty, so gritty time with it. And uh, yeah, overall, I would say I'm I'm very much positive. The the part that sort of I'm less positive about is kind of the third act, the long third act. I thought the movie was a bit overstuffed, and um, the the final action scene in particular in Gotham City Garden I found to be kind of frustrating and unnecessary in some ways uh, because what I liked about the movie pretty much from top to bottom before that was that it very much felt to me like you know I could see someone saying I love this movie or saying oh, it wasn't for me but but however you felt to me the Batman very much felt like it was a a personal project for uh, Matt Reeves, for the director. Like, I felt like I was seeing someone's vision of this character as this young person who's still figuring out what he's doing, um, you know, and it's so filled with detective work and callbacks to, you know, uh, kind of bleak noir films, crime films. And it, it, it all felt very cohesive. You know, there's all these interesting themes in it as well that we could talk about. And then... The end of the movie, it suddenly felt like some some other movie was intruding, like a much bigger, much more action-oriented movie where suddenly Batman is fighting like an army of goons like in a video game, and um, and there's water, and, and, and people are running, and like, again, at the very, very end, you sort of see what that sequence is there for thematically and how it ties everything together and these ideas about vengeance and darkness and all that sort of stuff. So I, I can understand from that perspective why it was there. I just felt like, tonally, uh, it just didn't quite fit. Plus, the movie was already like two and a half hours at that point, and I, and I felt like we had reached a pretty satisfying point, or could have, um, before that. Uh, so, you know, overall, definitely a positive uh, review, a positive reaction from me, but I wouldn't say it's a perfect film. It's certainly not my favorite Batman film, anything like that. Okay, cool. Well, I want to get into those, that third act. I know you and I talked about this, not on camera. I want to get into that a little bit later because everything you've touched on about the themes, I agree with. And also it did kind of organically feel like, wait, are, are, is this, is going, this is still a thing? All right. Uh, but first, Pat, I want to hear from you. What's your review, your take, your thoughts on the movie? Yeah, I... Uh... I liked the movie a lot. I've uh, I saw it for a second time last night, which I'm, I'm glad I did because you know it's it, it's kind of overwhelming. It's a three hour long movie, and there's there's a lot in there, and uh, especially the, the thing that struck me so much the first time is uh, I, I I really appreciate just like how much this movie like deeply commits to its its whole vibe and being as as, as bleak and grimy as it is and it it feels like especially surprising for like a a big expensive superhero tentpole it feels way less like studio noted than these things tend to uh with the possible exception of one thing that i'm sure we'll get into later um and yeah and i i will say like what, uh, what a tease pat <laughs> what a tease <laughs> To we we gotta keep people watching later. as we go. Uh, you know, set up stuff to pay off later. But I, I cut you off. Sorry. But I, like, but I, I have to admit, like, coming into this as, as as much as you know, we have like infinite comic book movies these days, and uh, you know, I'm 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 kind of exhausted by a lot of the uh, the like MCU stuff. Uh, Batman is the the one like property or character that I I remain like kind of like 
fanatical and obsessive about, and I will always be, like, deeply interested in whatever new Batman thing is coming out. And so, because, like, I've been, you know, fairly obsessive about Batman since I was, like, four years old. And so I kind of come into a movie like this sort of from, like, two perspectives of, like, you know, looking at it as a movie and then looking at it as a Batman movie. And I think it's a good movie, and I think it's a, a very good Batman movie. And so, you know, seeing it, the, like, the second time, some more thing like, I was able to, uh, I guess, more cleanly figure out, like, what are the things that really work for me and what are the elements that I think it could be stronger, uh, it could do stronger. And I, that third act that I'm sure we'll talk more about, it, I think it worked better for me than it did for Matt. And that's mostly because I think it really clicks together thematically. And I find the, the way it serves Batman's character arc, I think is really satisfying. Uh, there is like, it's funny because for such a long movie, it sounds ridiculous to say, oh, I wish there was more time and uh, I wish it, you know, I, I wish it was longer. I wanted to see more of stuff. But as much as it's, you know, a lot has been talked about it, how it's like kind of the rare Batman movie where Batman is absolutely the main character. You know, he's often kind of overshadowed by by, by villains who, who are given a lot of screen time. He's absolutely the main character here. And I, I will say, especially in, like, the, the maybe the middle hour, uh, I kind of wish it, it it had been able to explore a bit more of, like, how how Batman is actually like his feeling, like, his internal world. One, like, my favorite stretch of the movie, I think, is maybe the first half hour of it. Uh, and I love the way it starts with Batman— uh, Every Batman comic ever pretty much has the the running internal narration with, like, the caption boxes. And this movie starting out with Batman having a voiceover narration, then you see he's, like, journaling, like, uh, his, you know, his his nightly expeditions. I loved so much. And then that that stops until the end of the movie. And for so much of it, like, like in the middle, as he's doing all this detective work, I, I wish it had been able to get a bit more into, like, his kind of, like, internal life and how he's feeling especially because alfred is not as big a character in this movie as he is in like the nolan movies and alfred's also the only person who that he really has any kind of relationship with outside of the mask and so he's not really talking to anyone about anything and so when you get to some stuff without spoiling anything some stuff that hits him like you can pretty have oh but we can spoil so when yeah. you get into some stuff where he's you know he's feeling, you know, he's learning, he's discovering revelations about his, his his parents, and he's feeling betrayed by Alfred. I feel like because the Alfred relationship wasn't as developed as as it could have been, uh, and it, it, I didn't really feel like uh, this, this, this massive, like, like um, emotional hit that Bruce Wayne was taking that I think the movie wanted us to, and I wish we had that a little bit more uh and and so like you know, we see very little of like almost anyone's life outside of like being on the job for such a long movie uh and so and, and also i'm kind of mixed on the riddler uh i i generally love paul dano as an actor i'm not i'm not sure i love his performance in the, in this movie and uh, and I'm 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 a little bit mixed on some of the the Riddler's ideology there. I love the story that he sort of sets up, and uh, w w with with the clues and the murders and it's and it leading to this exploration of, you know, of this whole big interconnected world of uh, you know Gotham politics and crime and stuff like that. The Riddler himself, I'm I'm less enamored with. Um, as much as I sort of like laid out some of my my problems with the movie, I think. It's general handling of like of building this world and 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 committing to this aesthetic and a a Gotham that feels very lived in and very cohesive, and and uh and and managing to have a take on Batman that does feel unique from the billions of other Batman movies that we've had. Um, I really love. I think uh this is a movie that I can I can see myself like just putting on a lot once it's like out on Blu-ray. Just because I like the vibe of it, as bleak as it is, I like looking at this movie. Uh, you know, I feel like you know w w everyone raves about Greg Fraser all the time, but I think he does really stunning work on this. I think it's maybe my favorite Michael Giacchino score in like a decade, 
And uh, and so yeah, I I did really enjoy this movie. And uh, but I, it's almost it, it's just that it is not the perfect masterpiece Batman movie that I you know I'm I'm sure we'd all love. But that's my general take on it. Now, see, that's interesting because Pat and Matt, you guys have very, not very different takes, but slightly different takes in that Matt really thought it was too long and Patrick wanted more. So to that point, Patrick, you talked about how you thought that like, oh, we could have gotten into his head more and seen more of Bruce's life. But I thought the movie did a good job of like him saying, I don't care about Bruce Wayne. Like this is all that matters, even though like his fortune is at stake and he could literally lose the cave if he doesn't like go to an accountant meeting. And then the, my, what I talked about earlier when I said that like, I didn't feel like the movie needed to do a lot of that heavy lifting because it was standing on the shoulders of Keaton and Bale and all these other incarnations. So we, we know that he's a haunted person. Uh, at least that's how I looked at it. So for me, a lot of it was almost like, I kind of took it as read that he has this relationship with Alfred. He did mention at one point, I think Alfred dropped the line like, I taught you how to fight, which is more from the Earth One comic. and I. I didn't want to see a Batman origin, but I thought that was extremely interesting, that this Alfred is like a soldier and a fighter, and he really helped equip Bruce in his war on crime. Uh, Matt, what do you think? Are we, you know, about Pattinson's take and whether or not we should have seen more of like that, the regular life of Bruce and Alfred? Well, we certainly needed to see how his parents died, because I was wondering about that the whole movie. <laughs> like, what? Uh, how did he become Batman? This is so bizarre. What happened there? I'd like to know. Were there any pearl neclaces involved? What happened? What I... sort of jewelry was his mother wearing? What yeah, was his I mean, name? We, need to, we need to know these kind of things. Um, you know, um, listening to Patrick talk about Pattinson and wanting sort of more of, of his sort of interiority, I, I can understand where he's coming from. To me, you know, I thought Pattinson was really good in the movie doing what the movie asked of him to do. I did think at times he was a little one note because the movie didn't really ask him to do much more than one note, which was to be this kind of, you know, I am vengeance, burned out, kind of uh, infuriated ball of, of rage. And to, like I said, to some extent, that is what the movie is about. And I think if they do make a sequel, he'll have an opportunity, based on the ending, to maybe take the character in a slightly, if not different, then more complicated direction, which I, I would like to see. But for again, for a three-hour movie, he is sort of like one guy doing one thing, you know, all the way until the very, very end where we start to see a glimmer of a change. And again, I think he does exactly what the movie asks of him, but it is a little bit repetitive in some sense. You know, you're not seeing the variations of what this guy is ca capable of, what he's going through, you know, you compare him to a, a like a Michael Keaton Batman who we saw some different sides. There was some humor, there was some like really intense like rage, you know, the you want to get nuts guy, like we don't really, you know, like this, you know, I've heard people call him like goth Batman, emo Batman, uh and to a certain extent that's kind of like those are accurate. Like he is just sort of this very sullen, moody, quiet um guy and you know, like Patrick was saying, Alfred is a very minor character. They don't have a lot of scenes together. There's not a lot of him telling people how he feels. And so I think where that hurts the movie is, again, in that ending where, you know, he has this moment of revelation where, you know, one of the Riddler's goons throws his own I'm vengeance line back at him. And that creates this sort of like, you know, that's like a moment of clarity for him, which I think is interesting. And, and it all works within the movie, with the ending, but I think it would have had an even bigger impact if we had like heard more about that throughout the movie, if we had felt more of that throughout the movie, besides just having that be a line he says at the beginning, um, and then, you know, occasionally people refer to him that way throughout the movie. I, I, I did think that there was, he was kind of just, he kept us at a remove. And so I do think as strong a Batman as he is, I do think that, Maybe whether it's you want to blame that on the screenwriting, the construction, whatever, that that he's not the most like nuanced or complicated a Batman that we've ever seen. Um, but again, like if they do make a sequel, I would be very interested to see how the character evolved. And he, you could see him becoming a slightly different, less 
you know, grim, uh, less angry figure. At least, if, if he didn't, then we, we're going to look back on this movie and say, well, what the heck was the point of this movie? Because that was the whole point of the ending. So, yeah, I think... I, I would be you know, terrified... I, sorry, I would be terrified to see this Batman smile. Like, I kept thinking that, like, if this Bruce Wayne ever tried to crack a smile... He doesn't, have to, sm he doesn't have to smile. He could just kind of do, a, like, almost an almost grin. Just kind of, like... I will say, I there think what we need is... You, you know the part in Batman Forever uh, when, after he talks to... I think after Chase Meridian kisses him on the roof, and he walks away, and then without... When only the camera can see, Val Kilmer does this smile in the bat suit and it's such a, a truly bizarre image and uh i think that's what we need we we need them to recreate uh the weird kilmer smile cool so i want to circle back to what matt was saying about the length and i'm of two minds about this so i agree with everything pat said about how they the, the ending for me with the goon and the vengeance line for me that worked because it tied in so well thematically it's what our whole ending explained video is about about how we drew the, they drew the parallels between the Riddler and the Batman, showed how they had very similar origins, and they both think they're acting in, for the best interest. And the Riddler even sees got the Riddler even sees Batman as his partner. So I did like that it brought it all to that. But there is a part of the movie where, you know, it, it joins this echelon of movies like Casino Royale, where I go, wait, this is over. Like, why why are we still going? So something like that extra ending added in there can throw a lot of people off and really make them go. The thing you don't want is for people to leave a movie saying, oh, God, it was good, but it was three hours. You know, like Mitch Hedberg said about pancakes, you're all excited at first, but after a while, you're sick of them. You don't want to be like pancakes. So that to me is interesting because I like everything that happened. My butt was still getting a little sore in the seat. So I'm curious to hear more. You know, Matt, I want to hear more of your take on that. And also, Patrick, you can start us off here. Like, what did you think about, like, was there a little, little bit of fat there at the end? I will say I... I really did not mind the length of this movie, and that may just be, you know, me being just like a a weird Batman guy who's like, give me all the Batman you got. Make it make it five hours long. But I think what I liked about the length of the movie is that I'm, I'm not the first person to say this, but I, f I feel like we get so many superhero movies that we're very used to, like, the general structure of them. They're really good at aiming for, like, this, like, two-hour and 15-minute running time, and so we kind of... We always know where we are in the movie. And this did feel kind of, to me, a, more like, you know, consuming, like, a 12-issue limited series of, of Batman, where it's, like... And I, I dug that it was able to take its time, uh, like, more than these usually do, and, like, kind of go on detours and stuff like that, and... Uh, to the point where, especially like when I saw it the first time, I was just thinking like, I don't know how far into the movie we are. I don't know if we're halfway through, if we're, if we're two hours in. I really, I really don't know. And I think because like the world is so kind of immersive and cohesive, that uh, I was happy to follow it down all these detours. And I don't. I mean, for me. The, the, that that last, I guess, 40 minutes, hour of the movie, the last act or whatever, it didn't feel too much to me. I think, I don't know, I it felt very clear, at least like w as it was happening, that it was not wrapped up yet. And I also, I really like Casino Royale and having that like sort of like five act structure that it has. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying every movie should do. I mean, like the Dark Knight kind of does the same thing. It's uh, it has it has this sort of weird structure with like that you know more more acts than you kind of expect it to, and uh, because obviously you know at the point when they you know they like arrest Carmine Falcone, it's like it is clear. It's like okay, that is I guess this one detour wrapped up, but. There's there's still more to go, and I I will say the thing that I think I wish had cl didn't fully click together for me. I kind of I, I I saw what it was doing, and um and I like elements of it, uh and I think this is what kind of holds it back from being as as strong a film as like The Dark Knight because you have to draw the comparisons there because what the Riddler is doing is like has its similarities to what the Joker does in that movie, but the the kind of shift in into just kind of like, you know, like incel uprising. We are going to like, like, you know, wash the city away and uh, and for like a full cleansing of everything and wipe out all the stuff. It it 
the ideology didn't w was not quite as clear to me as, for instance, like the Joker's final move in The Dark Knight, where it's like, okay, like now we now we have to put the city itself to this test, like with with the boats, and so and that uh, and so like exactly what the ultimate plan there was between the you know the flooding and then you know getting all these other sort of like Riddler copycats rising up to presumably uh assassinate the the new mayor elect but i wasn't sure if they were planning on like killing more people as well it, it, again the I, ultimate my goal read there, on it, it was it was an assassination plus just like a, a terrorist action where they were going to take out as many people as they could because otherwise why okay. huddle everybody into that space right but it also it, it, you know they didn't like make the super clear thing of like oh we have like literally ev like all of the important city officials in in one like the ultimate goal uh uh, their ultimate plan, beyond just, like, chaos and death in general, uh, wasn't as clear to me as, as I would have liked. And so, and I think that would have made that land stronger. If, 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 if it, you know, if we knew exactly what they were trying to do and exactly what it represented. And, and, and I'm not saying it's totally unclear, it's just a little, it's a little muddy for me. And so, again, th these aren't giant complaints, because I still actually, like, I, I enjoyed the final... That final action sequence, uh, I, I I really do dig, you know, Batman giving himself the shot of adrenaline, uh, which is a, a pretty wild move. And and but I'm uh, sure it wasn't Venom. It could have been Venom. <laughs> we're talking about Venom. <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm literally reading that right now. Um, but but yeah, uh, in, in general, I did not mind the length. Long story short. Well, I, I will say one thing about that Matt uh, discussed earlier rang true for me, and that is the way the action is staged at the end, you know, where they're on this set piece of the jumbotron over top of the garden and things of the catwalks and all that. To me, I felt like they were on a movie set at the end of Batman Forever. Not that it looked bad. It's just that the rest of the movie had this look and feel to it that, you know, Pat, you called it immersive, which I think is perfect. And then that part, though, was, it was a good action scene. Like, it did everything it was supposed to do, and it was great. But that part took me out a little bit. So I agree with Matt on that, that the way that was staged felt like it was it from a different movie. Uh, Matt, anything you want to say in response to Pat? Or oh, I mean, what you're, I cut I mean, you off earlier, too. What you're describing is part of the, the issue for me was that it did feel... You know, I don't object to a three-hour movie in general, or even this movie being three hours long. I just thought that the, the ending... It just didn't really fit in a satisfying way. Like what you're describing, like visually, it doesn't look a lot like the rest of the movie. It did t also to me feel like all of a sudden we're on like a green screen or, you know, it just tonally felt very different to me. And then the the things that uh, Patrick is talking about with how the, you know, like the mechanics of what exactly they're aiming to do and what they want to do are totally unclear. Um, I almost think you're giving it too much credit. You're like, well, it was a little unclear. It was totally unclear. I had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> You know, like, um, and this is the Riddler who is so meticulous about planning every little thing to perfection. And he's, you know, he's the chess master who has engineered this enormous plot and done everything exactly how he wants it to be done. And then at the end, it's just like, well, they're going to show up and shoot a bunch of stuff and we'll see what happens. Hopefully they kill her. Maybe they don't. Maybe they kill other people. Maybe they don't. We Like, it's suddenly he's gone from being the, the mastermind who knows, who's 10 steps ahead of everybody to basically you know, throwing it all up against the wall and hoping something sticks. And I think a, another problem that I had with that is, you know, he's not directly involved in that scene. You know, like, he's captured. He's in jail. And so, like, emotionally, I'm less invested because it's just, like, some random guys that are from the Internet who, whose faces we don't see and we don't know them. We don't know why they're doing this other than they're, you know, j you know, sort of generic Internet trolls who've been seduced by the Riddler and they're angry. And, like, we can, we can uh, put... Uh, from the real world, we can sort of infer why they're doing it. But, like, it's not like we've ever seen those characters before. It's not like we've ever even really realized he was doing that until a few minutes before. And so you have Batman fighting these guys who we don't know, we don't care about, we don't really know what they want. And it's just, to me, it's like we've gone from this very intimate, clear, you know, detective story to this big, frenetic, different-looking action movie where the main villains... You know, because the, the Penguin's not really involved in there either. He's, you know, all the main villains are sort of out of the picture at this point. So it really just becomes like action, you know. And again, the very end of it where 
Batman has that moment of shock, uh, you know, when the guy says, I'm vengeance, and then he goes and saves people, you know, and he's using a flare, and he's gone from being the shadows. He says, I am the shadows in the beginning. Now he is, like, literally a light, a beacon. Like, that all works. That's all great. I'm just debating whether the way they did that was the best way to do it or was the most effective or satisfying. Like, I just think that the way they got to that place didn't entirely connect with me, work for me. Even with the part that works, that, that sort of emotional ending, it still feels to me like someone somewhere looked at the movie and went, holy crap, we made a two hour and 45 minute movie that has like three minutes of action. We gotta put, we gotta end this big. We need, this is a Batman movie. We can't just have him be walking around in apartments going, hmm, yes, I, you know, I know who did it. <laughs> like, it, he's gotta punch some people. He's gotta kick some people. So, and then sure enough, there's a 15 minute big, uh, visually striking but visually different looking action scene that it just feels very tacked on to me in a lot of ways. I was ambivalent. I mean, I thought it was like, oh my God, they're going to kill everybody. I had that feeling about it. But like you guys have said, the moment when he unmasked the guy and it's the guy from the funeral earlier, this kind of bit background character who people like Bruce Wayne never pay attention to. So the audience didn't pay attention to. It's that guy who has been inspired by not just the Riddler, but by Batman. Because even if this guy is not emulating Batman, he's emulating the Riddler who is emulating Batman. It's escalation. You know, when, as soon as Batman, this has been explored in so many great comic books, but as soon as Batman decided to dress up as a bat and fight crime outside the law, he instantly made it okay for people to put on masks and do things outside the law. So what he's looking at in that moment, to me, is that all of these people are a reflection of him. And I loved how they use that moment to make it like Matt, you said, he, he learns he has to be a beacon, step out of the shadows. For me, that made it all worthwhile. But let's talk about the Joker reveal. Matt, I know you really didn't like the Joker tease. I definitely thought it should have been a mid or a post credit scene. It was very out of place because it doesn't matter for this movie. Like there's nothing about Paul Dano making a friend and that friend being the Joker that affects the story that we're currently watching. It's just there to tease the future and to get fans excited. Plus the news had already leaked. So I, I wasn't surprised. I've known about it for months. That scene, I honestly, I hated. And um, I do think it did not belong in the, in the main brunt of the movie. And I feel like if it, had, if it at least had been a post credit scene where the movie doesn't really have a post credit scene, it has that little itty bitty tag at the end with the, uh, with the, the with website. the Riddler's screen or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you put that at the end, then okay, fine, whatever. But putting it in the middle of this, uh, you know, sort of very elaborate uh, denouement where everything is kind of flying together, and we have to wrap up the villains, and we have to wrap up Selena, and we have to wrap up the Batman, and get to his emotional, you know, catharsis and all this stuff. It just felt totally out of place. It distracted from what the movie was about. It also felt, again, like something from another movie where this movie is totally self-contained. It's about this one guy and this story. And all of a sudden, we've got maybe a Joker, but we're not showing his face. We're playing coy. We're teasing stuff. It, again, felt like, well, we got to give more supervillains. We got to give a tease. We got to have something to make people want to, you know, talk about what's going to happen next, want to see a sequel. All of that, again, you cut that part out, and all of a sudden, I'm, I, I feel much better about 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 the ending as well. Pat, what did you think about our Joker reveal? Well, I teased it earlier in the conversation, but uh, it's by far my least favorite part of the entire movie. I uh, straight up did not like it um, for, for several reasons. Uh, first off, we, we, we've talked already about how kind of refreshing it is, how self-contained this movie is. Like, I feel like we've been so trained by Marvel movies especially to expect at some point, a surprise character appearance, whether it's a character from a past movie or whether it's Harry Styles as a new character here here to set up future movies. Like, that's like, you know, par for the course with this genre. And one of the reasons I was excited about The Batman is that uh, I knew it's not connected to the other DC movie universe. It's just going to be... It's th this thing. No one's going to show up to, like, you know, set up a spinoff or a sequel. And and then this was exactly that. This was a, a post credit scene in the movie. But also, it's just, I'm so f***ing sick of the Joker. Just, like, deeply. Like, we, in, 
counting this, carrying, counting uh, Barry Keoghan here, we've now in the past 15 years had more Jokers than Batman in live action, which is absurd. Two people have won Oscars for playing this character. And I don't, I don't want another Joker. I'm just, I'm, I'm over it. Great character, but I don't need another one. Uh, and then also, Batman Begins already ended with a, a tease setting up the Joker. So we've had that in, like, a first installment before. And also, it seems like what we're seeing here, based on, like, the little glimpse of him we can see, he's, like, mostly hidden. But it, it seems like it's another kind of, like, grounded take on the character, but I guess he has bigger facial scars than Heath Ledger did. And I, look, I think Barry Keoghan is a great actor. I, I love him. Great actor. I don't, yeah, I, I have zero interest in seeing more of this character. Uh, and uh, I, I, I could use a 15 year break from the Joker. And also Batman has the greatest like collection of villains in basically of any like fictional character, um, maybe ever. Like do anything else. Give me any other character but this. If he if he had been in uh you know Arkham talking to I don't know, Calendar Man or Clayface or the Mad Hatter, anyone anyone else. Poison I, Ivy. I, I, I Poison Ivy. Yes, sure. I I I would have been Condiment King. Okay. I, I, yes. Condiment oh my King. God. The uh, Clock Condiment King. King. Clock King. Oh God. Those All guys those who kidnapped guys. homeless people and made them work for them when Bruce had amnesia in the animated series. Exactly. And give me like playing over the intercom the whole time. Give me goddamn Maxi Zeus, the guy who thinks he's Zeus. <laughs> give me any of them. I just don't want to see the Joker anymore. And so, uh, so yeah, um, that scene, thumbs down. Uh, apparently, I saw I seen that Hollywood Reporter article from like late last year that they were testing two versions of the movie, one with the scene and one without the scene. They should have gone mm -hmm. with the version without the scene. The other issue I had with that scene involving the Joker and, and Riddler is that they sort of put the Riddler in this movie into kind of almost a Joker-like position. Like you know, we we've, we've compared some of his plans even to like, you know, Patrick, I think was comparing it to the ending of The Dark Knight, which is uh, something I thought of too when I was watching it. So they've already, you know, you've almost made the Joker redundant in a way, which, you know, I think is okay because like as Patrick said, we had enough Jokers. We don't really need another one. So it was kind of refreshing to have a different Riddler and one who was so different than like the Jim Carrey Riddler, who I'm not insulting. I'm just saying it's just to a totally different, you know, not manic and wild and goofy and you know, bedazzled and wearing incredibly tight spandex and all that sort of stuff. Like, and by saying, well, here is the Joker, it's kind of like, well, he's like, how, I, you know, if they are going to do it, like how different can it be from what we just saw? And then the, the, the implication that they're going to be like buddies, you know, like, you know, he gives them the riddle about like what, you know, where the answer is a friend, like he's going to be friends with the Riddler. And it's just like, are you going to go like full Batman 1966 with like, you know, like the Joker and Riddler and Catwoman and whoever else all working together, which I love the 60s and the Batman penguin. for what, and the Penguin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love mm -hmm. the 60s Batman for what it is. I actually think it's wonderful. But I have a hard time imagining like Joker and Riddler pals as like working in a sequel to this this kind of a movie. It just sounds very strange. So, yeah, I uh, I was very much not a fan of, of that scene. All right, Matt, Pat, thank you guys so much for joining us. Patrick, tell the people where they can find you. Well, you can follow me on various social media platforms at Patrick H. Willems. And, uh, and, but more importantly, you know, the place where I talk about movies the most and uh, for the longest amount of time is YouTube at youtube.com slash Patrick H. Willems. And there are videos there, some of them, about Batman. And we're going to have Patrick's uh, channel linked down in the comments. He does have some great Batman content, including defending the Schumacher films. You should really check them out. And Matt Singer, where can the people find you? Uh, well, um, all my work's at screencrush.com. Uh, you can find, like you were saying, our my review of the Batman. There's some Batman rankings on there as well. And my Twitter account is at Matt Singer. All right, thanks guys so much for joining me, but let me know your thoughts on the Batman down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and hit that bell. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.